Hi everyone, welcome to the Model Gaming Show. Uh, it's Saturday, sorry I'm a little bit late, but work came up, can't really do anything about it, so better late than never. Uh, I want to start off with the new releases for this week, and it is with my pleasure to announce Super Mario came out this week, Assassin, Super Mario Odyssey, Assassin's Creed Origins, and Wolfenstein the New Colossus. Now Super Mario currently has a 98 on Open Critic, which is phenomenal. Assassin's Creed hovering around an 84, and Wolfenstein the New Colossus at an 88. Uh, Destiny for PC also came out this week. Um, there aren't really many reviews on Metacritic right now. Uh, there's just about six from last time I checked, and it had it about an 83, 84, which is what the console versions had. Um, you know, the only thing with the PC version is that you can unlock frame rate, better graphics, so smoother, um, but pretty much the same game. A um, few stories I want to dig in early on, okay? Uh, Switch, they had a huge update and uh, for their system, and one of the random consequences, Re Reggie Philippe, the president of Nintendo of America, even said that he had no idea that this happened, it was like a happy accident. But that GameCube controller functionality is now available for the Switch. Totally random, but I thought it was really interesting. Um, Rockstar publicly came out and said, hey, there's no DLC, single player DLC for Grand Theft Auto V. I mean, I, everyone can assume that that was never happening. I know there were a few people that held on to that faith, but come on, it was never happening. And the reason, anybody's guess, come on, easy, GTA Online was bigger and more sprawling than they ever thought it was going to be and way more successful. That just prints money for Rockstar. So for the next game, I, now the way they said it, they said we would love to do single player DLC, uh, whether that's for the next GTA or Red Dead Redemption 2, um, who knows, but I really hope that they, they have learned their lesson and really do make single player DLC since the single player DLC for both Red Dead Redemption and Grand Theft Auto 4 were highlights. Undead Nightmare was fantastic, The Ballad of Gay Tony, fantastic add-ons. Uh, Lego Dimensions, like Disney Infinity before it, is dead. Um, all these toys to life are failing. Um, the only thing that's super successful is Nintendo's Amiibo, and that's just because they're not really tied to anything, right? It's just they're little figurines that happen to have something to play uh, that can support your game, but they're not required. So I think that that is uh, uh, something, it was a good effort, good try, but it reminds me a lot of um, Guitar Hero, where not necessarily putting out so many iterations, but getting the, the these throwing in all these characters and having this ecosystem this economy with it with buying all these figurines i think it was just oversaturation with the characters and everything it, the cost was really great to both disney and i think warner brothers does lego dimensions can't remember uh but it's dead um another speaking of dead microsoft announced that the connect is also dead um, I want to delve into this a little bit more deeply. Um, when the X, when Microsoft announced the Xbox One, I, I, I was pretty excited, and I bought into their $500 system. Uh, I was one of the people that was against the grain. I actually thought it would have been a good idea on how they did it. No discs, um, digital downloads, and connect functionality. And the backlash was so crazy that uh, they had to ditch the Kinect off the system, drop it down a hundred bucks to save money, and that's why they're playing catch up this this generation. Um, and and for me, I think what's pretty funny is that it's it's kind of gone that way. There are more digital downloads now than ever, um, and and the Kinect, even though it's dead, they're really pushing AR. And that's kind of just like the more advanced version of AR. Uh, apparently, Kinect's camera and sensoring is, is really advanced. It's more advanced than we knew. And um, they're, they're using it for AR. So I'm actually pretty excited. It's, it's, it is dead for the Xbox. People won't use it. Um, and that's fine. You know, it's too ambitious for a video game system that, frankly, people want to play games, right? So let them handle it over on the AR 
uh, in the AR sector, but four games, I understand why it's dead. Um, devs saw the writing on the wall from the get-go and were not really supporting it um, because of the backlash uh, at the announcement. So I understand why it's dead. I think it's I think it's another example, though, of the vocal minority um, at that announcement just trashing it. And I really think that it would have done well if that price would have come in at like 449 instead of 500 or even 400 and they would just take like a massive loss it would have been fine but because it came in at 500 and had to connect it it was that perceived value was just too high um i feel like i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about it uh i'm not a member i don't really go on the forums at all um, but let's discuss NeoGAF here just for a second before we get into our, our main subject here. Um, NeoGAF basically imploded over the past week uh, amidst sexual harassment concerns from the, um, from the owner and proprietor of NeoGAF. And listen, these are serious allegations and we live in a, uh, we're living in a really important moment in kind of the United States cultural history right now with um, filmmaking and television and people coming out against power, uh, against that power to brush aside sexual harassment and in some cases, unfortunately, rape. Um, Neo Gaff unfortunately got caught up in all of this. And uh, when the allegations happened, uh, Neo Gaff basically shut down like completely. And then when it brought back up and users just lambasted the hell out of it, rightly so, um, it's unfortunate because even though I wasn't really a part of it, NeoGAF served millions of members and it was a no BS, excuse me, it tried to be a no BS community. And that's really important in today's day and age where you have to be civil. Um, obviously that can't be the case everywhere because of the anonymity of the internet. But in this case, I feel like NeoGAF was a positive force and it's really sad to see what happened and to see someone like the owner um, in such a place of power abuse that power. Um, there is a new forum if you're looking for one that's kind of sprung up out of this called Reset Era. And I think that uh, they're trying to ape what NeoGAF did, but with, obviously without the stigma that it now has. Um, I hope that NeoGAF survives and that it can go back to the way things were, but I also understand if people don't wanna be a part of that community. So our main story tonight, okay, um, it's it's pretty interesting uh, what's happened with Visceral. I, I, I really wanna dig into what I think is the core issue behind all this because people are so quick to blame EA, right? It's, oh, they don't want single player games because the line he said, and, and so much has happened, okay? So first, I, before, before I get to the main point here, first I wanna, I wanna read a quote from the very controversial ex-Bioware developer. His name is Manbir, I hope I'm pronouncing this, Air, H-E-I-R. So people have a lot of problems with this dude, frankly because he can come off like a racist and a bigot and um, a sexist, and, and it's disheartening that he is one of those people, he is one of those controversial figures. Um, he no longer works for Bioware or EA. But he had some really choice, choice quotes that I wanted to read to you. And just to give you a sense of how EA operates, right? I think we all know, but I, I just wanted to read these quotes to you. So, EA, only care about the highest return on investment. They don't actually care what the players want. They care what the players will pay for. Those are subtly different things. Uh, damn right, it's very true. And um, and that that is, I think, my favorite quote, is what people will pay for. That's why FIFA and all their sports games are so successful, is because people will pay for those add-ons, right? Um, this is definitely a thing inside EA, inside of EA. They are generally pushing for more open world games. And the reason is you can monetize them better. So that kind of goes directly in relation to um, the executive at CA, Soderbergh, um, Soderlund, Soderbergh, sorry, um, saying, you know, this is a single st single player story driven game. 
that you can only play once and we want people coming back again and again, right? So that those were that's what everyone hung on to uh, on his words. And, and that, yes, I get that, but as we'll find out a little bit, that might not necessarily be the case for why Visceral was shut down. And the final quote, which is pretty astounding, and it's the most shocking, especially for a game with such uh, a storied and troubled background as it is uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. I've seen people literally spend $15,000 on Mass Effect multiplayer cards. So that is why when people ask, oh, why is everything going towards loot boxes and DLCs and microtransactions is because that's where the real money is. You get someone who paid $60 for that game and then invested another $15,000 excuse me, 15,000, I realize that is a extreme outlier, but I guarantee you, if you're into that game, you're putting in an extra 50, maybe 100 bucks. I mean, instead of, instead of a $60 game, now that becomes potentially a $200 game for them. And, and that's a huge thing. So we already kind of explained this last episode about what taking his words and, and putting them into a context on EA is going for multiplayer, right? They don't want to make single player experiences anymore. And so everyone trashed them because they're like, ah, that's what happened with Visceral, right? So let me tell you what actually happened. Um, Jason Schreier, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of Kotaku, he's uh, a fantastic journalist, okay? Video game journalist. And he just recently released a story on the true reason why Visceral was shut down. Um, and it's a lot more detailed and in depth than you would think. Um, much like Mass Effect, this game had many chances and had many things going for it and against it. And it was several different things that broke down Visceral over the years. There was a lack, a little bit on the side of a lack of budget, but only, they, they only had like 40 people working on the game at any one time a lot of the times. And their studio was being put on Battlefield, Battlefield Hardline multiplayer, and they were all stretched. So it, that's definitely one thing that hurt. Another was, yes, director Amy Hennig is amazing. Everyone from this report, the, this, this article that I read, praised her direction in coming up with a fantastic story and cutscenes and that whole thing. But apparently she wanted, she, she didn't trust anybody because she didn't know anybody. To trust and so she felt like she needed to be everywhere and involved fully in every aspect of making this game and because of that it changed it, it some the report said some things took weeks to get authorization because she was out doing voice recordings or level design or whatever that's not really her job and that that wasn't what her job was supposed to be and because she was the be-all end-all with every decision, it really slowed production down. Another thing that slowed production down was LucasArts and that whole aspect of the Star Wars license. And same thing, because they needed approval um, from LucasArts on, oh, would he carry that blaster? Would he carry that? Like, they micromanaged the shit out of everything. And that's not what you want. You don't want everyone micromanaging it. And, and... That seems like what working with the Star Wars license is. Last week I made some comments basically saying EA should be minting money. But if it's like this with every game, then I totally understand why they're not. Because if you got to get approval on even the tiniest of details from LucasArts, then it's going to take forever to get your game made. So for me though, okay, the, the, the throughput with all this and which Jason mentions in his article, and what I've been thinking about for a while now, is the main thing that plagued both Mass Effect and this game is EA's absolute stonewalled insistence that they use the Frostbite engine across the board. And now we've heard from two major studios in a row working on a game with trouble that the Frostbite engine is not meant for all of these games. It is meant to be used for a first-person shooter experience, not third-person. There's a th This came up in the Mass Effect talk as well, 
uh, when that was all coming out is that the Frostbite engine has no business being used for third person and that basic aspects of game making aren't even involved in it. And that's literally repeated again here that some of the developers were saying that, uh, um, you know, EA was pushing for a 90 Metacritic and he's like, with the engine, how it is, it doesn't even have, they compared it to Uncharted because that's kind of this game was the Star Wars Uncharted is that this game didn't even have tools that Uncharted 1 had, let alone comparing it to Uncharted 4. So to continue to use this system and the insistence that it keeps being used by EA, their expectation needs to be totally different. The only way that this would make any sense at all is if you spent a couple of years prior working on implementing and creating a greater tool set for Frostbite, instead of just giving it to these studios and telling them, here, go do it. Well, shit, that's not gonna work. How is that gonna work at all if you give somebody a whole new user set and it's not meant for it? Um, the My favorite quote was that if you get Frostbite running well for what it's supposed to do, it runs like a race car. But if it's trying to do something it's not using, like it's not used to, it doesn't run at all. So using this engine and they're insistent on using it and throwing it on people has obviously created a problem. This game now has, they've, they've canceled two Star Wars projects, two, since they've had the license and it's been the same damn thing. And, and one studio is now closed because of it. So whatever they go back to in the future, or what do they do in the future with this license, they've got to realize that they need to do a lot more work on the Frostbite engine than just simply giving it to these developers and saying, yeah, have at it, even though it's totally not meant for what you're supposed to be doing. That, that, that's the thing that bothers me the most, is that EA, as this big company, knows, of course, I totally understand why they want to use Frostbite. But then spend some friggin' time making it work for the systems that your developers need it to work for, right? Doesn't that make sense? Is that you don't want them wasting time and a ton of your money on trying to make tools and stuff that have no business in this engine. So that is that is it. Uh, I want to give you just a couple of brief impressions on my time of Super Mario Odyssey. I've played it for about five hours now, four or five hours, and uh, first what, three or four worlds I've been into, and I will say that uh, it's fantastic. If you have a Switch, it's a must-buy game, even more so than Zelda. It's just phenomenal. It earns that 98 Medic, uh, Open Critic rating. Um, there's just, I, I was smiling the whole time playing it. It's like that sense of childlike joy is, th nothing can create that better than Mario. And it's exactly like that. There's so many great features of it. Uh, the cap is ingenious and all the different, I, I mean, this is everything that you want in the game. My, my favorite aspect, just to go over, is, and I can't stress this enough, is when it, you're going and it comes to a 2D, 2D section and you jump into the 2D part and the music seamlessly changes into a 8-bit digitized version of that, it's, it's wonderful. Like the first time that happened and I listened to it, I, I was kind of blown away. The, the attention to detail in this game is fantastic. And I have about a hundred moons and that may seem like a lot for only playing for four to five hours, but they make it so they're everywhere and, and it's, it's not like a grind to get them because you naturally progress throughout these worlds. And it doesn't, it's not like a reset. Like in Mario 64, when you got a star, it kicked you back out of the level. When you get a moon here, you just get to keep going. And, and the freedom of that is, is amazing. So if you've got a Switch, you should be able to find one now, by the way. They're in stores. I went into a couple of Targets recently in stock. So you guys shouldn't have problems anymore. And you better act now before the holiday season starts and there is a shortage. But this is a reason to buy a system. Absolutely. Um, it, it is absolutely worth it. It's a huge game. Um, the level design and details are fantastic, the music is excellent, um, even more so than Zelda. I, I really liked Zelda, but for me Mario has blown everything out of the water. It's, it's just, you can't say this for many games, but it is an absolute pure joy to play. So that's it for this week's show. Thank you so much for tuning in for whoever is, and uh, when I get this actually up and running, 
uh, professionalize in January. We'll do a Q&A afterwards if anybody's watching. But for now, just doing uh, some talks online. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.